Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 461, Theories of Addiction Treatments. BioBalance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Moffin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health, and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Moffin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the newly released book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of T replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Moffin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Moffin's office is currently accepting new patients. When I first became a counselor 35 years ago, in the St. Louis area, a treatment of alcohol addictions was just the cat's meow. Every hospital had an alcohol treatment center. And the theories for hiring and staffing the alcohol treatment center were that you had to have been an addict, be one in recovery, in order to work there because only addicts can understand what addicts deal with and help them recover. And you had to have some of the staff that had an education and maybe a license. So the staff of the alcohol treatment centers would literally move from one hospital to the next over a five or six year period. They would have all gone a psych- uh, cycle. And so and, how did that work? Because you get ticked off, you get frustrated, you get tired, and you say, I'm going to go somewhere else. Okay. And then it's just different day, different stuff. How did it work for the patients? Well, that wasn't anybody's concern. <laughs> What the, I wasn't around doing the, the that. The cop then. out for that was to say, on average, you have to have three to five treatment cycles <laughs> to, to ever get to recovery. And it wasn't because the by recidivism insurance? rate. It was. You could get thirty okay. days inpatient treatment, and you go for thirty days and come out and be better, fall off the wagon on your way home, and be right back in the addiction. And it just it, it's a horrific process, but. In those days, people were talking about addiction as being alcohol, drug, uh, chemical problem, Mm -hmm. and they didn't think of other things as addictions, like food disorders, eating disorders, sex, gambling. Gaming. Gaming, video gaming, because it didn't exist 35 Mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. And so today, there are two major focal points for people that are working in the area of addiction. Mm-hmm. And they both recognize the other as important. One says, okay, I'm, I'm a doctor. I'm looking at the medical data. I'm interested in the brain chemistry. Mm-hmm. And I'm developing all these really new, exciting tools that are giving us more and more information, like MRIs or uh, a magnetic uh, resonance treatments that we didn't have before. PET I mean, scans that tell us what scan. part of the brain Absolutely. is not what's working. What's firing? Mm-hmm. What's if firing? What's not? If firing. you're thinking about eating ice cream, where's that fire in your brain? If you're addicted to ice cream, and now they know that there's a, now, an area of your brain that is wanting dopamine but not getting it, and well, so you're looking the thing for that they've identified. That, that's where the problem. And you're looking for something to solve that in your particular bent, whatever yeah, that is. Absolutely. But there's a part of your brain that stops. Some, some people, most people, from following their cravings. So that part of the brain is not lighting up in the MRIs of addicts. The, the, the uh, brake light is not working. The, the accelerator is. Well, so but, but, but there's still distinctions people, that have to get made. Because they both work. If, if, if I'm addicted to alcohol, mm-hmm. my body develops a physical dependence on the alcohol. Mm-hmm. And if I don't get it, then I go through withdrawal symptoms. Mm-hmm. I can have delirium tremens, and, mm-hmm. and it can be so severe I can die from that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can have the shakes. I can have nausea. But if I'm addicted to a, a video game or to chocolate and I stop getting chocolate, mm-hmm. I'm not going to go through the shakes. I'm not going to have delirium tremens. Mm-hmm. So, so the terminology has had to be expanded as we understand. And some, some of the way we've understood is this new technology that lets us see it, see it, mm-hmm. how it works, where it works. So we now know these things about the dopamine balance in the brain, mm-hmm. the synaptic cleft and, and the saturation of that cleft with dopamine, but we still don't know how to get dopamine to that location in the brain to the degree that we need it. So, the, mm-hmm. so they're trying to find ways to do Without that. Without addicting the patient to another drug. Exactly. Uh, and to get through the blood-brain barrier and get mm-hmm. it into the cranium where it mm-hmm. needs to be located. 
that's a challenge, and mm-hmm. we still have not found ways to the do medications that. for Parkinson's increase dopamine, but they also cause other trouble. Right. So, so we can't use those, and if you take too much of them, then you end up in a schizophrenic state. Mm-hmm. So, so that's why we do know how to get it there. We just but don't know. But it comes up with baggage that it, we can't afford. A lot of baggage that we can't we can't tolerate, and it right. doesn't make people just better. It just co- trades one problem for another. So you get in a situation where, if you're following the medical pillar, looking at dopamine, looking at naltrexone, looking at what's the other one? The bu. Oh, the um. I no, forgot. that's. Yeah, it's a it's a drug I don't use. Bub, uh, yeah, it's an um, opioid receptor stimulator. It's burenafrine. Burenafrine. <laughs> but it's 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 uh, attaches to the o- opioid receptors. You have all these different receptors in your brain. But people who are always feeling pain physically and emotionally, they their opioid receptors are hungry and they need opioids of some kind. We make them in our brain. But people who are in pain in that way, look for other things to, to solve their pr- pain, and that's an opioid. We're looking at what can we fill those receptors with that's not going to addict the patient. So, so two pillars, one being the medical, the other one being the psychological, emotional. Mm-hmm. We want to learn how people acquire an addiction, what their payoff is, where the two areas of concentration seem to cross is when we discuss the reward system. Mm-hmm. The human beings, are, uh, animals, living animals, respond to reward, and they seek out reward. And there are different rewards that we mm-hmm. respond to. All of us respond mm-hmm. to different things. So the challenge for an individual, and, and if you're doing therapy with somebody, if you're doing talk therapy with somebody, is to try to figure out what's your payoff for that behavior. Mm-hmm. And, and I have conversations with my patients about, you know, every choice that you make costs something mm-hmm. and pays something. Mm-hmm. So the challenge in good mental health is to figure out, can you afford the cost of your choices? Mm-hmm. You know, do they come with a price that you can't afford to pay? Mm-hmm. And with things like alcohol addiction or opioid addiction, the cost may be that you die. You lose your job, you lose your marriage, you lose your health, you lose your life. Is having this reward payoff in the temporary moment worth that risk? And can we find alternatives, whether they're blended with like a drug like naltrexone mm-hmm. uh, that doesn't let you get the same high, uh, high then it, it blocks the absorption of, of those chemicals mm-hmm. at the receptor sites. Mm-hmm. So you don't get the payoff. So you're like, why take the drug? Right. But then you have the other issues of addiction that you have to deal with, especially if they're the chemical addictions mm-hmm. uh, where you have the shakes or nausea or, or what have you. The withdrawal symptoms. The withdrawal symptoms. Mm-hmm. But then, so that's a physiological response to a physiological stimulus. But what about things like gambling uh, or video games? I raised a child that has grown up in the video game era. And I now read a lot in the literature and I talk to an awful lot of people that are concerned mm-hmm. that even grown ups are getting sucked into this uh, constant presence of media. We, we have cell phone. phones, we have iPads, we have computers. Uh, corporations. I, mean, I get a little freaked out when I don't have a phone in my hand. Well, yeah. You know, so that's a little bit of an addiction. But, but you have a 24-7 job. Mm-hmm. You have the life of your patient's mm-hmm. responsibility in your hand. Mm-hmm. And now we have ways to get to you. Mm-hmm. And and we didn't used to have because you could close the office and go home and people would have to call the call service and then they would reach you if it was an emergency. Mm-hmm. But you didn't have to deal with that. Mm-hmm. Now people that know you can, can reach you on your cell phone mm-hmm. and say, hey, I got a problem. I mean, I'll call you sometimes about a friend of mine mm-hmm. and you don't even know who that is. Mm-hmm. But I'll call you at 10 o'clock at night and say, I got a friend with a problem. Well, I'm intruding on your day off and your, and your rest and relaxation. Yeah, but I'm used to it. You have to accommodate that. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's your addiction. <laughs> Yeah, it might be. But so, so raising my child, who also has ADD, when he was younger, we became aware that he would get so subsumed by playing the game that mm-hmm. he was playing, trying to reach another level, trying to acquire enough points, or you, you get treats or trophies or whatever, that you collect all these things as you go through the game. He would get so emotionally invested in that. That when you work with ADD kids, you, you teach them about foreshadowing, or you have to learn about foreshadowing. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, you set timers. You you have to find ways to interrupt they don't, because they don't their have, brain gets I don't, so. I don't have any idea of time. Like I don't know. I can't close my eyes and know yeah. how long we've been talking or how long I've been in a room with a patient. Right. I have to have I have to have clocks everywhere. So, and, I and so we did that with my son. We set timers, and he hated them. He would hide the clocks. We'd have, we'd have to go find them and put them back out. And, and we'd have to say things to him like, we're leaving in 10 minutes. You need to turn the game off. And he, you know, he'd get more intense and play faster. And I'm talking about four, five, six. Mm-hmm. And, and we would say, okay, it's time to go. And he'd be like, no way, I, let me get to the next level. Well, you play that game a little bit. And, and he said, because well, you, you, you want to accommodate, you want to help. But what we learned was, he never got to the next level because there was another level. Right. So and then there has so to be a payment we would, for that. We would unplug it. Yeah. And he would have a meltdown. Uh-huh. He would just decompensate, be screaming, crying, carrying on. So we had to work with finding ways through that uh-huh. so that that didn't happen. So and, that, and most people ignore it and don't find a way through. And then they become adults that do that. <laughs> it's like ignoring a cancer. It gets bigger I, I know. and it gets more you deadly. You can't ignore it when you see it. Right. In because a, my responsibility as a parent is I have to – Raise him to be an autonomous, independent, functioning, contributing adult. Right. He can't just be self-indulgent and play video video games or golf all day and not not do his work. He, mm-hmm. He's got to he do has something. To do his work and be productive. To be productive and mm-hmm. and to have relationships and to be healthy. So now I went to he went to college, and I went to his college to visit him. And he had four roommates in a suite. Each of them had a separate bedroom. They had a common area in between with a kitchen, a bathroom, what have you. So I go into his, his room, and all four bedroom doors are shut. I know he's there, so I'm knocking on his door, and I open the door, and he's sitting at his computer with headphones on playing a video game. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm playing a game with my roommates. Mm-hmm. And I look around, there's nobody in the room. I said, where are your roommates? He said, they're all in their rooms. So these four guys were all playing the same video game and having a, a social encounter but not seeing each other. There's a no, danger to that. There's a huge danger to that. I mean, people, that. humans, babies, adults need human contact, physical contact, like being in the same room as and touching. And all, that's a requirement for being human. And the social skills. And the being social Being able skills. to read your yeah. body language, being able mm-hmm. to see your face, being mm-hmm. able to know if I've offended you or hurt you or attracted you or mm-hmm. whatever I may have done. They can't get that over a device. Right. But the people that make the devices and make the and they games. Know, they know it so well. They, they know how to keep them there. They know how to keep them there. They get entrapped and it becomes an addiction that they really have an emotional or physical cost separating well, There's a lot of money from. made on addictions. Yeah, there is. I mean, Absolutely. There, there really is. And, and truthfully, and, there's a lot of money and, made trying to treat it. Right. That's. <laughs> Absolutely true. Both ways. There's a, there's a lot of, and there's a lot of damage in between. Right. You know, so, and we can't change our free speech or, or, or our economy to change that. It just isn't going to happen in this day and age. We sadly. have to find the balance point. We have to, we have to take care of our own children and our own families right. to try to find a way through. But that's usually the hardest audience. Yeah. You know, that's, that's really difficult to do. But what I, um, I thought this was a wonderful article, and it was, it was in National Geo several years ago. Yeah. But I was just going through them, and I saw this, and I thought, this is, this is excellent because there's, they have all the ways you can treat addictions without being harmful. Like they now have um, magnetic Resonance. head st- yeah. stimulation. And we, one of my nurse practitioners has that for her mother so that she can think better. She uses it for her stimulating her brain so well, that what she they've can learned think is better that the and it magnets works. Cause the, and this is again well, we're some all of the electrical. new brain research. We're, our bodies are electrical. The, the information that we are acquiring about how the brain works mechanically mm-hmm. is impressive and exciting and hopeful. So and, and we did a podcast a couple three weeks ago about new treatments for depression. And what I found interesting in reading this article is a lot of these treatments that they're doing for depression, they're also doing for addiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, the magnetic resonance thing where you send off magnetic pulses that go through the brain cause a realignment of some of the but brain. But they, cha- they set it differently for addiction yeah. versus depression. Well, they can charge for it differently that way. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it probably makes a difference <laughs> yeah, as well. Maybe. But maybe, maybe. But also meditation, uh, mm-hmm. Buddhist meditation. Uh, teaching people, they, they will say to you, if you're going to use meditation, and uh, you have to get centered. You have to sit with the urge, the craving. You have to honor it. You have to recognize mm-hmm. it. And then you have to explore what that feels like if you don't satisfy it. I mean, you try to just stay mentally focused on it and calm down and not, not chase the rabbit. 
that satisfies the, mm-hmm. the addiction, not, not reach for the reward of the payoff of another game or another drink or another indulgence of some kind for that activity. Talk therapy. Let's talk about how mm-hmm. this is damaging your life. Let's talk about it's costing you your marriage. It's, it's, it's cost you your job, your career. You know, are you going to be reaching a point where you can fight it, when you can go in another direction and not have this be so destructive because mm-hmm. you see that it's killing you? But when I was when I was talking to you about this, and we we right. have a discussion the day before we do this, I was I was like, you know, this is a high economic society's problem. Yes, because people who aren't in a in a uh, first world country who have time to spend, who don't have to fight for their meals every day, don't have to make their bread by hand, don't have to wash their dishes in a stream. I mean. We have time to be addicted. I mean, there is addiction in other societies, but for some reason, there's more people trying to eat and sleep and and live. They they're overwhelmed with that necessity, and they don't have the time to be, or the money to be addicted to things that you have right. to pay for. Right. So I so this is is a U.S. European first it's, world it's country a civilized culture problem. Yes, predominantly. And, it and does we, exist in some limited way in, uh, in non-civilized societies, but civilized Western cultures, this is a problem among all of them. And, and the, the one problem that we don't view as an addiction is workaholism because we view workaholism as a productive thing, which many of us have, and that's our problem. Like I never, my, my mother taught me that, I mean, we didn't have much, but my mother taught me that if you don't finish your work, you can't go play. And I still can't go play. I can't go play golf unless all my charts are done right. and I've answered all my right. my it's emails. It's an emotional block. Because you I, freeze. I learned that early on. Right. And so some of these things, we we learn our addiction to food early on. We're crying. Mom well, hands you, us ice cream. If you belong cream. to the Clean Your Plate Club, mm-hmm. you, you, you know, as a respect for your mother and the fact that she made this meal for mm-hmm. you, you have to eat all this food. Or as a, 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 a teaching device to say, don't take more than the appropriate amount, right. you have to eat all you took. Mm-hmm. So if, you're, if your eyes are too big for your stomach, mm-hmm. you learn not to take so much. Right. And so, but I worked with a lot of people that developed eating disorders because they were driven to eat all of the food on their plate. Well, my dad, you know, that's part of being Italian. My dad's Italian, and he's like, you eat everything. And then yeah. I'd, I'd eat it, and then he'd go, you're fat. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be like, Mixed message there. I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> take, take less. Yeah, take you know? less, and then, you know, and yeah. then he, but, but then it was the same thing. Oh, you haven't right. had enough lasagna. Right. I mean, that, so, uh, you can't so we it's do a, a lot of this right. to our children, and even if we don't mean to. Right. And so, and, and so it's a challenge that predominantly we can identify and recognize in successful, advanced civilizations and cultures. But it's a real problem. We got so smart, we gave ourselves problems, I guess. That, you know, that seems, we gave ourselves seems to be the, yeah, different problems. Yeah. I mean, now that we don't have to work so hard at surviving, we could be spending our time on charitable things. We could spend our time on art and, and Education, science learning. And, and learning. But many times we just waste our see the same work ethic. We waste our time on being addicted. Well, as, as Robert Palmer says, we can be addicted to love, <laughs> and that's the other which addiction. is different than being addicted, addicted to, to sex. sex. Yeah. That's true. That's but, true. But those are addictions, and, and so when we talk about the two pillars of understanding and approaching treatment for addictions, both pillars recognize the importance and the contributions of the other, but say, I think I have the better way forward. I can help Mm -hmm. you. The important thing is it's not a one-size-fits-all problem. And so while you might be better disciplined to avoid a food addiction Mm -hmm. but fall into workaholism, Mm -hmm. I might be better disciplined to avoid an alcohol addiction Mm -hmm. but fall into a sugar addiction. Right. Right, and everybody's got their thing. Everybody, and find, that's, that's yeah. kind of how we. It's that think whole about reward it. system. What's the payoff? What what can you get can your payoff you st- for? And can you stop right. going after your craving? Can you get enough and then just stop? Does that part of your brain work or not? Right, and that's important too. And, and a question that comes up is, you know, for instance, if you go to a twelve step program, do you? If the twelve step program works for you and you are successful in stopping your addiction of whatever that was that you went for, whether it was narcotics or sex or alcohol, because they all have their own twelve step mm-hmm. programs, 
then do you find another addiction? Do you find a replacement addiction? Well, everybody in AA is smoking (laughs) because that's their next addiction. I mean, that's a more acceptable addiction than drinking. So so two questions. One is, can you stop having destructive addictions? Mm -hmm. And the other is, if you have to have an addiction, can you find one that's more socially acceptable and beneficial that has secondary payoffs? Like workaholism Mm -hmm. puts more money in your bank so you can afford other things or you can afford to pay for your treatment for your addiction. (laughs) Right, but you know, I always, I always figured that if I didn't try it, I would. I mean, the things that you can try, like cocaine or heroin, or oh my god, I mean, if you can avoid you it, can avoid then you don't it, become addicted to and it, and you don't try it, you're not going to be addicted to that. You know, so there are certain things you can avoid, and it doesn't mean like what you said is not sex to be. A, you know, you're going to be a perpetual virgin. That's not what I'm talking about. But I mean, the substances you you could well, choose to the, avoid the addictive element is the payoff and the the quest for the payoff and for some of these things, the physiological requirement. You build up a tolerance for that. You have to have it. If you remove that from your body, you go through withdrawal, Mm -hmm. you have physiological reactions. So you need the balance in the treatment of the medicine and the therapy, meditation, uh, magnetic resonance. There are things out there that are new and growing uh, in, in our information base that help us learn how to travel down this road. But at the end of the day, it's still a challenge for each of us individually to avoid having these addictions that are damaging and destructive to us in our lives. But hopefully you will be encouraged to look around and, and seek out treatment, whether it's medical or psychological or both, for the people that you know that struggle with addictions. Thank, Thank you, you for listening. listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.